We're glad to be here. Uh, TD and I uh, have uh, traveled together for how many years now? So, was it eight years we were figuring out? Uh, eight, nine eight, eight, nine years now. And uh, we have seen healing in many countries and many situations. And uh, he's always a pleasure to tra travel with. Uh, I tell everyone that TD is my, by the way, this TD stands for Tulsa Don, which is a real cowboy name, if you don't recognize that. He, He's from the city of Tulsa, so he's called Tulsa Don. And in any case, um, he's my PR guy um, because everybody likes him more than they do me. And even my dog likes him better. Uh, so come on up here, TD, and let me introduce you. And uh, TD uh, is a very, very uh, kind man, full of mercy and kindness, and uh, successfully, uh, and he's very humble too. That's right, that's very humble. <laughs> And uh, in fact, I gave him an award uh, for his humility, but I had to take it back after he started wearing it. Uh, <laughs> in any case, uh, I wanted him to share with you a little bit uh, this evening about how he learned how to uh, do healing ministry, and then I'm going to tell you my story as well. Thank you. And, uh, but I wanted you to hear it from him. Um, he, uh, he does have healing working very well. I've been present when he's ministered to people who are in wheelchairs, and in fact, he's going to tell you one of those stories, yes? Okay. Uh, and, and people have come out of the wheelchairs who have been uh, quadriplegic in one situation. So uh, he has been very, very successful in getting people healed over the years, and he's a pleasure to travel with uh, because he helps me uh, because I don't have as many people to pray for, for one thing. <laughs> so go ahead, D.D., and share a little bit with him. I'm going to turn. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here, and I uh, give a big howdy from Texas to all y'all. And uh, I, uh, Roger, usually... Uh, Am I on? Okay. All right. I usually do all my quotes from the TIV. That's the Texas International Version. So uh, Roger sometimes has to translate for me. Uh, I did uh, grow up kind of a country boy, and Roger's a little bit rock and roll, but we still get along and uh, enjoy traveling with him. I, uh, the way I got started in this was uh, I knew when the Lord brought me back uh, under his wings that uh, I was destined for... Uh, healing ministry. I just didn't know how to get there from where I was at. And uh, through all my effort, how many knows that it's through your effort you don't really get very far, <laughs> you know? Well, I, uh, I did meet up with Roger, finally. But it was a divine appointment, and uh, I soon learned how to get there. And uh, I uh, spent about a year going to every single seminar that he uh, did no matter where it was at I tried to I tr always tried to be there because I just couldn't get enough I wanted could it really be this simple you know and it was the uh, the way I learned how to do it was uh, through fear <laughs> uh, when I was uh, I was hanging out with him all the time anyway and so he got to where he would have me come up with him at his home and wherever we do a healing seminar and and I felt real comfortable in that kind of a situation because Roger was there. And when that person got healed, I thought, well, I was glad I got a little portion of that, you know. But when we got to, uh, he asked me if I could, uh, well, actually, he said, I'm going to be going to Geneva, Switzerland. And I said, can I go, huh? Can I, can I? So uh, he said, yes, by all means. So I, I tagged along with him. And uh, after we did a, our normal thing here, Roger uh, preached the word told everybody about the about what is yours through Christ Jesus and we did a, a demonstration we had a person that healed from a chronic back pain and and uh, after that Roger said okay we're gonna open it up for all of y'all to come on up and he said uh, I'll have a line here and TD's gonna have a line over there and we'll just uh, y'all just line up in front of us and and we'll start ministering to, to the people and uh, my immediate re reaction was I turned and looked with this stark terror on my face and thought, you've lost your mind. What do you mean? My own line. I've never, this is a first. And he just grinned at me and said, uh, yeah, you over there. I'm over here. And I just walked over there very meekly and just saying, Jesus, help me here, Lord. Don't uh, you said you'd never leave me or forsake me, you know. Don't you said you'd never embarrass me, you know. Lord, you got to do something here. And... Uh, so he did. He responded, and uh, I, uh, from that moment on, I had a miraculous healing right there 
uh, and it was so astonishing to me that that as soon as I saw this man just healed instantly, I, my response to that was, next. You know, I, I knew now that it had nothing whatsoever to do with me. It was all him, and as long as it's all him, what have I got to fear? So uh, the, the story I'd, I'd like to share with you is, uh, I shared it with a couple of folks here tonight, earlier this evening, but uh, it's worth repeating. Uh, this is one of the earliest uh, healings that the Lord did through me. This, uh, this woman came up, and she was totally deaf in both ears, and she wanted prayer for her hearing. And I said, yes, no problem, you know. We can take care of that. And she goes, also, can you pray for my little dog? And I said, why, sure. What's wrong with your little dog? And she pulled out this little picture of this little brown dog, and he was so ugly, he was cute, you know. It's just a little hairy, long hair, brown dog, and it had 11, they called it 11 cysts. It had 11 cancerous tumors on its little body. And I put my hands on it, and I prayed over that little dog. And I said, okay, now let's see what we can do for your hearing. And uh, I uh, did feel a little bit of heat as I put my hands on her ears, a little bit of tingling, and I, I knew that she was receiving some healing. That's a good indicator of if you're feeling heat. Uh, it gives us uh, a, a sense of saying, yeah, something's really happening here. And uh, after a few moments, I had her check it, and she said, well, I, I do feel like I'm hearing a little bit better, but it's still kind of muffled, you know. So I prayed with her again, and a third time, and she says, well, I, I do think it's, it's better. And I says, well, I think you have gotten it. If, I think if you go back home and you talk, call your uh, doctor on Monday morning, you can have a, you know, make an appointment and go have your hearing tested. And... Uh, that was the last we saw of her. We were there for uh, two weeks. And uh, actually, on the very last day of the ministry, uh, when Roger did his thing again, he had, he had taught the word and uh, asked folks to come up, I saw this uh, woman from the back of the church fighting her way to the front. And my experience now, even though it's only been about two weeks, I, when I see somebody hungry like that, those folks are ready to receive. So I'm saying, oh, this, this one's going to be easy. I hope she comes to my line. And she did. And uh, so she said, do you remember me? And I said, well, kind of, sort of. And she pulled out a picture of that little brown dog. And I go, oh, yes, the ears, the deaf, the dog with the cyst. She goes, yes. And I wanted to tell you that uh, my hearing, I did what you did, I told me to do. I called my doctor, made an appointment, and... and uh, Monday morning, my, uh, we're, we were getting ready to go for my appointment to have my ears tested. And uh, luckily, she read lips because her and her husband was fighting and bickering back and forth because she was running late and he was wanting to go. He was, and she said, I will be ready in just a few moments. If you'll answer the telephone, by the time you get off the phone, I'll be ready to go. And then they stopped and stared at each other for a moment. And uh, she didn't, didn't have her hearing aids in and she had never heard the phone ring without her hearing aids and they realized she can hear she went and had her ears tested and her hearing was perfect then the real hammer to this was she said and also my little dog 10 of those cancerous tumors did exactly what you said they just dried up and fell off and she says but I got one little tiny one left about the size of her, half of her little fingernail she goes if you'll just pray for that we'll make sure I know it's going to drop off too but I just want you to pray for it one more time and I said well yeah and I uh, prayed for that little dog again and I know that he was totally healed and uh, Rogers gracefully let me say one more this is a really good one this was about halfway through our Geneva trip uh, we were at this uh, this church and I noticed up on the front row there was a young man in a wheelchair and uh, I found out later that he uh, he had multiple multiple dystrophy and uh, MS yeah MS yeah multiple sclerosis and he uh, he was sitting in this wheelchair just kind of like a he had no uh, use of his arms, his hands. He could, the only thing he could do is move his head. He had not even been able to feed himself for years. He had to be spoon-fed, and he couldn't even get out of his wheelchair. He had to be assisted in everything that he did. Well, a little Christian girl had brought 
him and two of his buddies. Uh, that's the only way they could get him into the church because they had to go up two flights of stairs to get up there. And, uh, and he, they wanted him to have prayer that night. And when Roger finished and said, opened it up for healing, this guy was wiggling in his chair trying to get up there to the front. So we went and got him and pulled his wheelchair up. And I, I was ready for this guy. I was, I was inching towards him, waiting for the go-ahead. And uh, we started ministering to this guy. And uh, within a few moments of prayer and having him repeat this, our little catchphrase, this healing belongs to me because of what Jesus has done. And healing belongs to you because of what he did for you on the cross. I just kept ministering to him. And within about five minutes or so, maybe ten uh, I lose track of time. I flunk time school. You know, I have no, I, no concept. But uh, we soon got him out of that wheelchair. And he was standing. And I uh, just had my hand on him just to support him, make sure he didn't fall. And we just continued to minister to him. And then eventually, after a few moments, he was able to shove one foot forward. And then he stood there for a little bit. And then he moved, shoved the other foot forward. And he kept that up until... He was finally able to lift his foot and take a step. And then he started getting this smile on his face because he took another step and another step. And then his arms dropped down to his side. And then he started squeezing his fingers. And, uh, and then the next thing you know, he's running back and forth. And, and then he goes over to a table and he picks up a bottle of water and unscrews the cap and takes a drink. And now he's got tears. And he says, I want to know more about this Jesus. You've got to tell me. He was a, a Muslim. And uh, two of his buddies were Muslim that came with him. The little Christian girl had brought them. And all three of them received Christ that night. And when they left that church, he carried that wheelchair down those steps himself. And one of his friends got in it. And they shoved him. He shoved him down the sidewalk. And they were all hopping and skipping and singing and just having a wonderful time. So at 12 years, he had been in a wheelchair. And wasn't, wasn't even able to feed himself. And now he was enjoying life for the first time in years. So, Roger, it's your turn. Thank you, sir. Well, now, now can you see why I say everybody likes TD more than they do me? <laughs> he's got a lot of personality and, and uh, he's a very... He's, what, you, what you see is what you get. He's a gentle, kind, kind soul, and he's really easy to, to know as a friend. Uh, uh, he and I have, uh, um, we've come close to having an argument once or twice, but, uh, but TD is just too nice to argue with. So that's the problem. <laughs> well, I'm going to tell you my story. Uh, I've been in the ministry since the early 70s. I, res- um, I was saved in a coffeehouse ministry in West Germany. I was a young soldier. Uh, youth with a mission led me to Christ. And uh, from the beginning, I was 23 years old, and from the beginning of my Christian walk, I believed in the gifts of the Spirit, were functional. I was baptized in the Spirit the same week that I was saved. So I really don't know what it's like not to believe in the gifts of the Spirit. You know, and and our, in the Coffee House ministry, we were very idealistic, all very young people. And uh, we believed that if the Bible said it, we were supposed to be doing it. And so we did have early experiences with the gifts of the Spirit. Quite often saw words of knowledge and discerning of spirits happen. Uh, Deliverance ministry flowed in those days and uh, occasionally saw something that looked like healing. I have to say to you that for 20 years, though, as I entered into into a more, uh, uh, more public kind of ministry, Uh, I didn't experience healing that much. In fact, it was once or twice a year I saw something happen that that I wouldn't be able to tell you a story about today that was a true testimony. But the vast majority of the people that I prayed for uh, didn't receive healing, and um, I had theology that kind of matched my experience. Uh, You know, I kind of believed that that's the way it was, that God was unwilling to do these things. And I stayed in that condition uh, all through uh, my time as a U.S. Army chaplain. I was uh, served in the military. Um, and uh, in 1992, at the end of the year, I was praying about leaving the chaplaincy, asking the Lord about my future ministry, what, that would, what shape that would take. I didn't really have clarity if God was going to be calling me as a pastor or, or uh, do some sort of evangelistic ministry. I'd been successful at, at, at a variety of things, and so I thought anything was possible. 
The Lord said something to me unexpectedly. Um, uh, God doesn't always talk to me in words, uh, but when he does, uh, it's very significant. And it, it almost always, uh, I can look back on those, those words and they, they have a lot more meaning than I originally heard from God. And he said this question from, to me. By the way, if God asks you a question, one thing you can be sure about, uh, he already knows the answer to that question. But I didn't. I didn't know the answer to it. The question came like this. Why don't you receive me as your healer in the same way that you receive me as your savior? Why don't you receive me as your healer in the same way that you receive me as your savior? Now, that question caught me by surprise because I was not praying about healing. I was praying about my future in ministry. Now, looking back, I've been doing healing ministry for 20 years. I see that God was answering my, uh, my prayer, directing me in a certain way. Uh, but at the time, I didn't know that. Um, and so it didn't, didn't connect to me in my understanding at that moment. And so I uh, responded to the Lord in that moment, Lord, I don't really understand the question. What do you mean? You know, uh, and so I had to really ponder this question and went on for, I'm, I'm guessing, a month or so where I was really considering the theology behind this question. Why don't you receive me as your healer in the same way that you receive me as your savior? Now, this is how I became a Christian. I heard the gospel, the good news about Jesus. I, from a variety of sources, uh, a man named Mike shared the good news with me. Uh, I read it in tracts. Uh, you know, I saw it in this coffee house ministry, it had a variety of tracts, and so I read all those tracts. I came to believe that it was true, particularly after Mike answered a lot of my questions. And after, after I got my questions answered, I, at some point, I, re- I, I prayed the sinner's prayer and invited Christ into my life. So here's the order of events. I heard the gospel. I believed it to be true. I prayed the sinner's prayer. And something then did happen. Uh, I was born again. I experienced new life in Christ. People who knew me before really saw a real difference in me. I knew that there was a difference in me. I had peace for the first time. And uh, I think I... If anything, you could describe my life before I was a Christian, I would call it anxious. Uh, I had a tremendous problem with anxiety. But here I'm experiencing something. Now, the Lord is pointing to this experience of my salvation to get me to consider healing from that perspective. Why don't you receive me as your healer in the same way that you receive me as your savior? With the emphasis on the question, the phrase in the same way. Now, I believed at the time, and I still do, that Jesus died on the cross for my sins and my sicknesses. But I realized that I was not approaching it in the same sort of way. See, I believe I'm saved whether, uh, whether I feel saved or not. How about you? I believe the work that was done for me at the cross. I believe that some days I feel real saved, some days I don't feel quite so saved. How about you? And, but yet, I'm still saved. I know that the work is done at the cross, and I did receive Christ as my Savior. I do believe that He's received me that way. I believe I'm born of the Spirit, even if I... Some days I... Uh, today was kind of one of those days. It took me two cups of coffee to feel saved. How about you? <laughs> See? So some days, uh, you know, that, that, that I really feel it. Other days, I don't. I uh, was an Army chaplain, as I mentioned. One of the things that Army chaplains do is that they do a lot of marriages. That's because you have a lot of young people in the military and, you know, they come to you and they say, Chaplain, I love her. You know, I love him. And so they want to get married. And so you do a lot of marriage counseling, uh, premarital counseling primarily. And then I always had something I told them after we go through the ceremony on that, on that particular day. And uh, after things calm down a little bit and we're at the reception and, you know, you've done all your toasting and all this and you've cut your cake. I'm going to come up to you in a quiet moment, and I'm going to ask you a question. And this is what the question is going to be, and I want you to have the proper answer. The question will be, do you feel married? And the proper answer is, chaplain, it doesn't matter how we feel, we are married. Now, I believe that about salvation, you know, that salvation is not based on my feelings, and yet... The Lord is inviting me to compare what I believe about salvation with what I believe about healing. And I realized that I was not being consistent because despite the fact that I believe that Christ died on the cross for my sicknesses, he bore my pain, carried my sorrows, and by his stripes I am healed. That the work was already done at the cross in the same way that salvation 
My sins were borne by Christ at the cross. I was not approaching it the same way. If I didn't feel healed, I did not think of myself as being healed. And yet, that seemed to be the truth that God was bringing out. So I said to the Lord, Lord, I think I finally get this. You know, after 20 years of inconsistent healing ministry, it did explain to me some things that I was not approaching it in the same simple way that I approached my salvation. So I said to the Lord, today, Jesus, I receive you as my healer. Regardless of how I feel, you are my healer from this point forward. You get to see how I'm going here? That the work is already done for me at the cross. You bore my pain, carried my sorrows, by your stripes I am healed. Well, I wish I could say that that immediately worked <laughs> and I never had any issues with healing after that. It's not true. In fact, two weeks later, I had something that I had chronic problems with. I had a sinus infection. All through my uh, teenage years, well, actually from the time I was nine years old, I remember my first sinus infection. From the time I was nine years old till this particular time in history, I had one sinus infection after another. Sometimes on both sides, I would take medication for them. Sometimes it helped, sometimes it didn't. All through my military days, uh, I was an artillery officer before I was a chaplain. Through those days, I still had to function even if I had a sinus infection. I was out running with the troops, functioning in the military, and some days I was running fever while I was doing that, and alternating Tylenol and aspirin. But even as a chaplain, believing in healing and even having healing happening occasionally, what I was experiencing was ongoing sinus infections, despite the fact that I theoretically believed in healing. I just didn't experience it much myself. Anybody been there? So in any case, uh, you know, theoretically believing in it and obviously receiving a healing are two different matters. But in any case, um, um, I get this in sinus infection and for the first time in my Christian life, I actually stand in faith, believing that Jesus is my healer. And I wish I could say it worked immediately. It didn't. In fact, 10 days later, I'm wondering if I got this whole thing right. And uh, I did something I highly recommend. I reevaluated what had happened to me. I thought, did God really say this to me? Did this word really come to me this way? And did I get it right? Or did I, did I misinterpret this set of events? Is the theology that I'm expressing now, I've come to believe, is this correct? Is it really what the Bible says? I went through this whole process, and even though I was not feeling well, I was pretty ill, I came to the conclusion that I got it right, that this made sense. And so I said to the Lord, with some emotion, uh, don't generally yell, don't do that in preaching or teaching or anything else, but I think I might have yelled, making a commitment. I raised my hand and I remember saying, Jesus, I don't care how long this takes, you are my healer. Made a commitment. I think it was really the first time that I wasn't double-minded about it. I, kept, I was waiting for God to prove to me by healing me that this was correct. I had it backwards. I had to believe in order to receive, but I wanted to receive so that I could believe. I'd had that problem for many years. I think that's the reason why I didn't have a consistent experience with my own healing. Well, making this commitment, interestingly enough, going from being double-minded to not being double-minded, not waiting for God to prove it to me anymore, making a commitment, Jesus, you're my healer, regardless of what happens, I got healed. I was healed on the spot. Never had a sinus infection since then. I had an uh, average of three or four years, sometimes lasting months, several months at a time. I've never had another sinus infection. Well, amen. It worked. My wife being the real bright, smart lady that she is, she said to herself, uh, by the way, I, this is, she was very, very clever. She married me. Uh, my, my proud jokes are not working with you guys, so I'm going to have to. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I will have to work on that. Okay. The, uh, in any case, my wife is a smart lady. She, uh, she, in fact, she did better in school than I did, and she was a registered nurse and a very strong Christian. She runs an online organization of Christians right now. In fact, that's probably the reason why she's not here, because she's very busy in ministry most of the time. 
But in any case, uh, she, uh, she said, if this works for Roger, it'll work for me. It's a biblical principle. You know, well, God shows no partiality, shows no favoritism. King James' way of saying God is not, uh, God is not a respecter of persons. That's why, the way King James says it. What it really means is that what Jesus has done at the cross, if it's for me, if I can receive, then you can receive, and my wife can receive. Well, she had, uh, all through our marriage, and I guess even back to her childhood, she had problems with migraine headaches. And um, they were related to her cycle, and so she had one a month, basically, and they lasted for about four days. And, but she was wiped out for a full week because she would take some pretty heavy medications to deal with it. She also had very bad asthma and uh, t- had to take steroid medications in order to be able to breathe. And what happened was is that we began to look to Jesus as her healer. Um, I, I, think we just, I think we just decided if it worked for me, that it's going to work for her. I don't remember the circumstances of that first time we prayed together for that. But in any case, uh, she expressed that she wanted to do this. And so we did. And from that moment forth, she never had another migraine headache. She would have been completely freed from migraine headaches which is really wonderful because uh, it, it, was, uh, it was certainly, I have to admit to uh, feeling very helpless when she had one. You know, here I am a charismatic, spirit-filled minister of the gospel, do occasionally have healing happening, cast out demons, have words of knowledge, oh, have the supernatural happening in my ministry, led a lot of people to Jesus, you know, had a successful ministry, and yet my wife would be laying in that dark room whimpering in great pain and I'd not be able to do much to help her. And so seeing this happen was a real change for me too. I mean, a real revelation, the simplicity of looking to Jesus, believing the work was already done for her and that the will of God was for her to receive. From that moment we prayed, she never again had a migraine headache. On the other hand, the asthma did not leave that way. In fact, I would call it a uh, three steps forward, two back uh, process. Process. I have to remember where I am. Uh, and. Uh, and, but she would be much better. After we'd pray, she'd, uh, she'd, the, her, she wouldn't be as tight uh, in breathing. She would sometimes still use her medications, particularly in the beginning. And we would pray again, and uh, she would be better, uh, better again. If she would get tighter again, we would pray. And we went through this process, process for some time. And um, I would say six months into the process, uh, she was much, much better. In fact, she didn't need to use steroid medications anymore. Uh, she was taking shots. She was taking injections. That's how bad her breathing was. And by the time a year had elapsed, she was completely free from medication altogether and has never had asthma since. She was completely free from it. Amen. It was, uh, it was quite a change in her life, uh, being able to, I mean, she, she couldn't really go up and uh, she really had trouble with even stairs. I mean, she just couldn't breathe. And so it really would have made a major change in her activity level, being able to do things like that. Well, we begin to practice this same sort of thing with our children. I have to admit to when my children were small, even though I theoretically believed in healing, I would pray for them and not much would happen. They'd be hugging the toilet, you know, throwing up uh, some sort of virus or whatever, and not much would happen. I'd be puzzled by that. You know, I couldn't, uh, couldn't put a reason on why it wasn't happening. But now, uh, simply because my focus has changed, I'm fo- not focusing on them or myself so much, I think before I was feeling pretty inadequate. Uh, I'm still inadequate, but I just focus on someone who is adequate. In any case, I focused on Jesus, believing the work was done for my children, and we began to see healing happening with our kids. Well, during that period of time, I decided that um, I was really shocked by the, the, the ease of this, by the simplicity of it, because everything that I had been exposed to was very complex, 15, you know, 15 steps to getting healed. You have to do all these things. And now I recognize that a lot of that was very legalistic in its approach. Not really relying upon the grace of God and what Jesus has done at the cross. Today we see witches healed. Uh, we see drug addicts healed. All before they become Christians. Uh, you know, T.D. told the story. This was a Muslim who knew nothing, very little about Jesus. And yet he was able just to receive a healing, come out of a wheelchair and became a Christian afterward. Quite often we see those kinds of things happening. I had no theology for that. Because I've been taught that you have to go through this process. You have to make sure that they've forgiven everyone. Uh, that you have to renounce the occult. You have to deal with demonic activity. You have to do, I've been taught all these things that created a legalistic mindset that forced me away from what Jesus had done at the cross that somehow they qualified on the basis of that rather than having to go through a process themselves to qualify. 
And it made a huge difference that I began to see the, the transformation of this. The simplicity of this was amazing. And what began to happen is that I looked for anybody and everybody I could pray for. If you sniffled around me, I, was, I had my hands on you praying for you. And I often started, I started seeing things happen uh, you know, with people around me as well. I'm not, I don't tend to be shy about ministry things. I can be shy about other things, but I'm not shy in that realm. But in any case, um, I decided that I really needed to restudy the scriptures because I think I had read books about healing, but I had not really studied the scriptures so much uh, my, for myself. I'm a seminary trained. I, I know a little Greek and Hebrew. The, the Greek I know, he runs the delicatessen down the street. Um, I'm, I know enough to be dangerous with it. I can use the tools of the, ta the, the trade to really to work through. And I did do that. I started in Genesis and decided to work my way through the, through the Old Testament into the New Testament and discover what the scriptures actually had to say about healing for myself, not, not taking anybody's word for it anymore. And I, interestingly enough, there you know, it's 4,000 years of Old Testament history, and I found myself in the New Testament pretty quickly because there's not that much healing in the Old, Old Covenant. There's some, but there's not that much. And so I found myself uh, really seeing uh, the difference in dynamic between the Old and New immediately because all of a sudden now I'm seeing healing after healing after healing in the New Covenant, in the New Testament. And I see that Jesus is using 12 ordinary people, very ordinary. Uh, in fact, you know, I would call them rascals. Yeah, so turn to somebody and say, you qualify. <laughs> In any case, we're going to be doing, by the way, uh, we're doing a healing seminar tomorrow. It starts at 9.30? 10. It starts at 10 tomorrow. So we'll be teaching about getting equipped uh, I've had the privilege of uh, training um, by the fact that we've had booklets printed that go along with the seminar. I know how many people I've trained. And about, we've done about 10,000 people in training on that. And we have here many testimonies back of people you know, having a really good experience with healing, praying for other people after they go through the seminar. Sometimes people get their first experience of healing in the seminar or they get more advancement in the fact that they're already getting people healed, but they get some of their questions answered and they are able to come at this thing with more simplicity and get people healed as a result of that. They get their questions answered. So uh, we encourage you to come tomorrow. Uh, we get a lot of people healed at the seminar as well. So uh, if it doesn't happen entirely for you tonight, um, sometimes we pray for people on Friday night, they don't receive anything. Sometimes Saturday, they don't receive anything. But Sunday morning they receive, and I promise you something, God did not change his mind between Friday and Sunday. You did, we did. We uh, got a dealt. We were got something that was preventing us from receiving fully dealt with, and as a result, we came into this thing more sim with more simplicity. So, one of the things I want to encourage you to do is be persistent about this. Don't, don't give, don't give us just one shot at it. Okay, we get a lot of people healed on the second time we pray or third time, and uh, so. so um, but we are persistent. We don't give up quickly, do we, TD? No, no, not at all. We're, we're, we want to see someone healed. We don't, uh, we don't pray over you and tell you're healed and walk away either. That's not our approach. We want to know you are. We want you to know that you are. We want you to give us a testimony back that you are healed. We, uh, and, uh, we, uh, we, don't, we don't like those. We think those are kind of games that people play in this realm, and we don't play those games. We want to see genuine supernatural activity of the Holy Spirit bringing what Jesus has done for you to, into your experience. If it doesn't happen that way, we're not satisfied. Come on, shake your head. You agree with that? All right, okay. I promise you, we'll stick with you. Even on Skype, we'll stick with you on it. Okay, we, I do that quite a bit. In any case, what happened in those days is that uh, I was studying through the scriptures and I, things began to be very plain to me uh, that were not plain before. For instance, how did the disciples learn to do healing ministry? Well, it became clear to me. I never thought about that before. But it became clear to me that they didn't read a textbook. They didn't, uh, they didn't go through a course or anything of that nature. They saw Jesus. And they saw him demonstrate the will of the Father from moment to moment, situation to situation. They heard him say things like this. Um, when you see me, you see the Father. They heard him say, I didn't come to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. 
Uh, constantly, Jesus was pointing this 12 disciples in the 70 more later. He was pointing to a very important fact is that what they were seeing him do was not his idea. Healing is not my idea either. I don't have to convince God to do it. He's trying to convince me to do it. He's trying to convince you to do it. We don't have to convince him to do this. In fact, we don't, ever, we don't actually ask God to do anything. And I saw that Jesus wasn't asking God to do anything. He was just ministering to people from moment to moment, situation to situation. See, what I've discovered is that a lot of the ways that I prayed in the past were full of unbelief. How do they unbelief? I was asking God to do something he was completely willing to do. And sometimes I ask in a desperate way as if he was unwilling to do it. Healing is God's idea. It's good news, isn't it? We didn't invent it. We don't have to convince him to do it. It was his idea to begin with. And therefore, we need to get on board with what he's doing in that area. And then what happens is we'll start to see it happen much more readily. We don't have to convince him to heal the sick. He wants to heal the sick. You believe that? What good father would not want his children to be well and more people to become his children as a result of that? In any case, these Obviously, these 12 ordinary men did not learn to do healing by studying the Old Testament. That's what the Pharisees were doing. The Sadducees were doing that. And not a single one of them, as far as we know, at least in the early days, became a follower of Christ and actually was healing the sick successfully. They observed Jesus as he was healing the multitudes around him. So if you'd ask Peter, James, John, Mary in that day, Maybe God doesn't want to heal that man because he's created his own problems. He's reaped what he sowed. He's not lived a healthy lifestyle. He's not gone to temple. He's not you know, made the sacrifices he's supposed to make and so on. How would they have responded to that idea? They would have said, where did you get that idea? Jesus healed many such men. They would have understood that the will of the Father was being expressed by Jesus Christ. Very simple truth, but a life-changing one. When you get your mind wrapped around this, that the 12 disciples did not determine the will of God through a theology. They determined it through Jesus. He was the Word made flesh. He was their doctrine. He was their teaching. They would have understood what the truth was by he who was the truth and is the truth. He would, they would have understood simply by understanding what Jesus did from moment to moment, situation to situation. The scriptures tell us that Jesus healed everyone in the multitude repeatedly. Not just once, but repeatedly he did this. Ten lepers, what a great place to demonstrate that God's will is different for different people. What does Jesus do? He says the same words to all ten Tells them to do exactly the same thing. They all do exactly the same thing. All ten of them are healed. See, that would have been a perfect place to show us that God's will is different for different people. And yet Jesus didn't do that. And he doesn't do it in the multitudes either. There's a good deal of things that I discovered as I was meditating on the ministry of Christ and taking these passages apart and putting them back together. Looking at them in Greek and trying to determine what was there. I discovered that a good portion of what I have been taught by people who supposedly knew about this was wrong. It was wrong. It contradicted the ministry of Christ. It was not what he taught his disciples. A good number of ideas that were present in me turned out to be something that Jesus didn't teach. So uh, when I I wrote this book over here called uh, Performing Miracles and Healing, it really came out of my uh, really two years of meditating on the ministry of Christ. And many of the things that I talk about in there were things I discovered were not present in Jesus' ministry. In fact, his behavior contradicted. For instance, the idea that God is teaching someone through sickness. It's not present in the ministry of Christ. Not there. In fact, if if God was teaching people through sickness, Jesus was unteaching them everywhere he went. Not Not sending someone away, you haven't learned your lesson. Actually, what those ideas, I later discovered those ideas, many of the ideas that I've been exposed to in, in churches and leaders and books of people who supposedly knew about healing, really are medieval ideas. When the church got away from what Jesus taught and, and healing pretty much disappeared from the experience of the church, those ideas became replacement ideas for what Jesus actually taught. That God wishes us to remain sick for a reason. 
There's an excellent book that has come out in the last few years. I've been preaching this really for 20 years, what I'm telling you right now. But uh, come out in the last couple of years. It's called The Almost Perfect Crime. Anybody read it? It's a good book, isn't it? Almost Perfect Crime, written by Francis McNutt. And he goes through the history of how the church came to these views, how it got away from what Jesus actually demonstrated to his disciples and, got, and came to these other views. And as a result of these other views, we've interpreted God's willingness in a very bad way of, you know, giving explanations, alternative explanations for the reasons why people are not receiving healing and created our own set of doubts and our own set of unbelief as a result of that. Very important to come back to what Jesus taught. Well, as I started coming back to what Jesus taught, many of the things that I've been exposed to began to disappear. I began to see more and more people healed. In fact, I had written a popular book. Um, it wasn't about healing. It was really about another subject. But it was uh, popular in some circles because people were talking about the subject. And it was really one of the first books that was written on this particular subject. It had one chapter on healing in it. And I didn't know anything about healing when I actually wrote the chapter. <laughs> and I didn't know that I didn't know anything. I thought I knew something until I started actually studying Jesus. And then all of a sudden I realized there were, there were a lot of things I didn't know. And a lot of things that I thought I knew were incorrect. That were creating problems for me when I prayed for people. In any case, I, uh, I, this book opened doors for me to travel in ministry. And so I got invitations to speak in some churches. And because there was one chapter on healing in the book, the pastors often thought that I had healing working. Well, interestingly enough, it was perfect timing for this because I was starting to get it working. And so I got opportunities to practice. And to my amazement, I started seeing 15 or 20 people a month being healed. Now, that's not a lot. But in those days, remember, I went from one or two a year to seeing 15 or 20 a month. Now, believe me, I got very excited. Uh, and, you know, I was, my wife, uh, she could hardly contain me. I just would go home after every one of these meetings and tell these stories of what I was seeing the Lord do. I was starting to see people out of wheelchairs. There wasn't a lot of people, and even a high percentage of the people I was praying for were getting healed. But it was so much better than what I was experiencing before. And it started improving. In fact, what happened was I, uh, my ministry shifted because these pastors were telling other pastors that when I came to their church that they had a number of miracles and healings happen. And so pretty soon I was just, I wasn't getting invitations because of this book, I was getting invitations because of healing. And uh, it was really kind of amazing what was happening and the more practice I got, the more I was able to sort through what Jesus taught his disciples, the higher percentages of people I started seeing healed. And I went from 15 or 20 a month to seeing hundreds of, uh, on average each month going to churches. It's not unusual for TD and I to see a, a, a church receive four or 500 healings. You know, a good sized church. Uh, is, we've, we've seen that a number of times. And, uh, and in the mix of that, you know, a half a dozen genuine, really genuine miracles, unusual miracles. You know, we've seen, we see healing everywhere. We don't always see the, the miracles, you know, occur. Uh, draw some distinctions for you tomorrow about that, but uh, what, what I consider a miracle as opposed to a, a healing. But, but in any case, uh, uh, since that time, uh, it's been 20 years now that we've, I've been doing healing ministry, uh, I've, I estimate and I believe that hyping things, exaggeration is lying. So I'm not going to lie to you. I'm, a, I'm an Eagle Scout, American Eagle Scout. I believe, you know, trustworthy, loyal, helpful, friendly, courteous, kind, obedient, cheerful, thrifty, brave, clean, and reverent. The 12 points of the scout law. I believed it before I was saved, okay? I, tell, I, I do my best to tell the truth as I, you know, if I can. And so exaggeration is not part of what I want to do because people find out you're exaggerating and then it, you lose credibility with them. So we see, we've seen easily 25 to 30,000 people heal in the last 20 years. I've gotten the opportunity to speak in more than 300 churches worldwide. It's just been an amazing thing that's happened to me the last 20 years. Who knew? I mean, God, God I guess. Um, it's, you know, I've, it's been fun. It's been, uh, and you know, I've seen the Lord do amazing kinds of things, you know, with people, healing of drug addicts, and they become Christians immediately. Um, I'll tell you a story. I was in, uh, I was in uh, Australia, 
And uh, the pastor of this particular group came up to me and he said, do you see these four people that have walked in the back door here, Roger? And I said, yes. He says, well, there are four well-known witches in the area. The woman that's on the far left, uh, she's a channeler of spirits. Um, what do you want to do about this? And I said, not a thing. I can't think of a better place for them to be. I'm not afraid of witches. In fact, you know, sometimes when I've been to England, witches will show up at our, uh, at our meetings. And they're not there to uh, cause a problem. They're curious more than anything else. Because when they hear that people are being healed, uh, they kind of want to get in on the action of that. They want to do it. And they will come up to me and talk to me about my aura. You know, Roger, you have a bright blue aura. <laughs> and uh, so I will say, you know, I tr see, the thing is, is that I'm not afraid of witches, so I don't treat them with, dis with disrespect, not any more than anybody else, okay? I mean, I would, and so I uh, treat them kindly, and I say, uh, well, why don't you interpret that for me? And almost always they say something very positive. Sometimes they tell me my aura is different colors, so, you know, I don't know how that works, but uh, but in any case, uh, I find that they're very open to the gospel if you're not afraid of them. Uh, but many of us, unfortunately, we are afraid of them and we, put, and we put the law on them really quickly, you know, and as a result, they reject what we're saying, you know, reject us personally, and then we create an enemy for Christ. But in any case, uh, I find them very easy to lead to Jesus. But in any case, I was telling you the story. Uh, so the four witches in the back of the room, and uh, so I preached that night, and I don't remember what I preached on, something that probably... Uh, would be similar to uh, Jesus will heal rascals. You know, I try to qualify everybody. That's why I say you qualify, see. He'll heal rascals. He will. And then they're less rascally afterward because the grace of God leads us to repentance, you know. <laughs> the goodness of God leads us to repentance. Uh, but uh, it's clear that Jesus loves rascals because he'll heal them. And I've seen people in, involved in very deep sin, Christians, and Jesus heals them. The goodness of God leads us to repentance. And sometimes we think it's the other way around. If we've got a little legalistic bent in our head, we think that they have to get right with God in order to get something. It's not true. That's not true. They don't have to. But they will often if they receive the grace of God. But in any case, uh, so I preach the gospel and we get to the end of the meeting. We typically, we're going to do it tonight um, unless the Lord tells me otherwise, but we do what we call a demonstration we're, so, we're confident that Father wants to heal people. And as a result of that, uh, seeing that Jesus healed everyone in the multitude and understanding the will of the Father from Christ himself, showing us perfectly what the Father do, uh, wants, we believe that we can bring people up who are injured in front of everyone and minister to them in front of you and Jesus will heal them. Uh, and so we, you know, we're willing to put ourselves on the spot for that. And... Uh, so uh, I get to the end of the meeting, and I did that. I said, uh, I said, is there anyone here perhaps has a really bad, we like bad backs because you can get people to bend, you know, and they can't bend very far. And then after we minister to them, they can touch their toes and do things like that afterward. There's a real visible demonstration. Bad backs, bad knees, uh, elbows, you know, frozen shoulders, all of that works pretty well uh, to demonstrate with. Uh, you can't see cancer healed typically. Uh, even though we get a lot of people healed of cancer. Uh, by the way, I I'm, I'm, uh, was diagnosed with cancer 38 months ago, and my doctors, both doctors tell me, whatever you're doing, just keep doing it, Roger. I, I got healed the same month. Uh, my numbers have been perfect, actually better than perfect. My doubling rate for the kind of cancer I have is below zero, which is unheard of. So, <laughs> But you're hearing about it. So, Jesus healed me the first month. That's another story. I'll tell that story tomorrow, but... Um, any case, uh, uh, anyway, we, uh, I get to that place and I ask for somebody to volunteer. Well, guess who volunteers? Head witch. Now, here in Lima, I got to ask you a theological question. I hope that word theology doesn't bother you. It just means the word about God. That's really what it means literally. Is, uh, is she a believer? Now... Then some of you were quick to, I saw our heads move up and down, and, you know, some of you did, were smart enough not to answer. <laughs> um, I didn't ask if she was a Christian. That's a different question. That's a different question because there are Christians who don't believe. They sit in the pew every week and they don't receive anything God from God. They don't really actively believe anymore. They believed once maybe. 
when they received Christ as Savior, but from that point forward, they've been a skeptic about everything. There's lots of people like that. My father was like that. Um, Okay, well, be with us this weekend. Maybe you won't wait anymore. How's that? Well, I think we may get some answers. I believe that we have some answers for that. Don't we, T.D.? His name is Jesus. We'll make, we'll make sure you get that. You'll meet him. <laughs> In any case, uh, this, uh, this woman responds and say, I preach the gospel. I've asked for someone to come forward who's ready to be healed. She's believing now, the people in the multitudes that got healed, were they Christians yet? No, not really, because of the you know, day of Pentecost hadn't come. Church was not really formed yet in any kind of way that we can understand, but they were believers. They, Jesus said oh, 18 times in the New Testament, uh, in the Gospels, uh, he responds to someone coming for healing, and he ministered to them successfully, and he says, your faith has healed you. Or something very similar to that. Your faith has healed you. You've received according to your faith, as Jesus says those things. And so, yes, she's believing in the same way that the multitudes believed. Now, let me ask you this question. Who do you think receives a healing? Someone who believes or someone who's a Christian who's not believing? Yeah. That's, that's the bottom line. So we're going to help. I really believe we, we can help anybody with this. It's pretty easy, actually. A child can do this, all right? In any case, so I lay hands on this woman. She has a bad back. She, I guess the devil doesn't heal his servants, yes? Um, has a bad back. She can't bend. She's got a lot of pain. She can't sleep at night. She takes medication for her, for her pain every day. And uh, in any case, lay hands on her. And pretty soon, she's touching her toes, doing things she couldn't do before without any pain. By the end of the week, not only is she a Christian, but all four of the witches have become Christians. They're looking for reality. See, these folks are looking for reality. The point here is that she stood in front of me. I knew she qualified because of what Jesus had done at the cross. She didn't have to qualify because of her righteousness. She didn't have to qualify because she had made everything right with God because she had not yet done that. She didn't qualify for any of those reasons, and you don't qualify for those reasons either. You don't qualify for a healing tonight for those reasons. You qualify because of what Jesus has done, not because you've responded to that. They are wonderful that you have, but you qualify for a healing because of the cross. He bore your pain, carried your sorrows, by his stripes you're healed. We get believers healed the same way we get unbelievers healed, by looking to Jesus who has done the work for them. Is this good news? See, God isn't going to heal you because you're good. He isn't going to heal you because you're good. You can be, even go out and be better and you're not going to get healed that way. You're not going to get healed because you fix something that's wrong in your Christian walk. God's not measuring those things. He's giving you grace. Everybody say grace. grace. Now you can say it in a Texas accent and you've got to spread it out some. Okay. Grace. <laughs> He's giving you grace. The healing is a gift of the Spirit. It's a gift of the Spirit. And therefore it comes to you not because you're good. It comes to you because He's good. It comes to you because of what He's done for you at the cross. It comes to you and you'll never earn it. You'll never receive it on that basis. Believers ought to be able to receive regularly whatever they need from God. However, the church has brought a little bit of confusion in there with legalisms. You know, saying that somehow or another we're going, not going to get it and God doesn't want to have it, give us, you know, get it to us for some reason and so on. He's withholding it. In fact, some street evangelists that I know, they come up with this idea, which is wrong, by the way. They come up with the idea that God will readily heal unbelievers, but he has trouble healing believers. Now, why do they believe that? Because when they meet an unbeliever, the unbeliever doesn't have any legalism in their head. And so they get them healed on the street just by presenting Jesus to them. What, why do believers have trouble? Because we've been told you've got to do this, you've got to do that, you've got to cross this T, you've got to dot that I. And when you do all that stuff, then maybe you're going to get healed. Huh. That's not what's going to cause you to get healed. 
what you're going to get healed is when you come just like that person on the street comes. Just as I am without one plea. Do you guys sing that here? It's a real... They, they, in Baptist churches in America, they sing, they'll do that 50 times to get somebody to come to the altar. Only one unsaved person in the room, and they'll play it for them 50 times. But it's true. We just come to him to receive grace. We qualify because of the cross. God isn't going to heal you because you're good. He's not going to withhold healing from you because you're bad. Anybody hear that? We see bad people healed all the time. Bad people that don't know that they're really being bad sometimes. You know, and sometimes even bad people who think that they're being bad. God's not withholding healing from you because you don't have a full sense of forgiveness. However, you do need to believe that God forgives your sins when you confess them. Yes? First John 1 9, we do need to believe that God shows us grace in that area. I believe this, the, let me say this, God is the least legalistic person in the, in the world. He's the one that has the most grace. And he does not require us to fix everything that's wrong with us in order to come to him to receive grace. That's, that's the world's approach to things, to qualify on a basis of our righteousness. We don't qualify on our righteousness. We qualify because of Christ and what he's done for it on the basis of his righteousness. That's why God answers prayers when we say, just tack this thing on at the end and it needs to have meaning to us. In the name of Jesus. What does it mean? Not because of me, Lord, but because of him. Answer my prayer. That's why you get healed. In the name of Jesus. You won't get healed on the basis of your righteousness. We've seen people over the years who have struggled with that. I was ministering at the Toronto Airport Christian Fellowship. We did have a, a, a reputation for the miraculous. Um, uh, I had the privilege of going up there and training their team in the area of healing. And uh, John Arnott, uh, which is the pastor of that church, told me at one point they had everything working but healing, physical healing. He said, you think you can train our folks? And I said, certainly. Well, on the first time I went up there to train, um, we did get a lot of people healed, healed in a, a particular service we were doing. We had about, oh, maybe 5,000 people attending that service in there. And we did a demonstration up on, after I preached, a demonstration up on the stage. And I think there were 11 people that got healed one after another up on the stage, doing all sorts of things they couldn't do before. Uh, it was quite, you know, it was quite an quite a evening. Well, the thing wound down, and, and uh, I'm up talking to their worship leader on the stage, and this is a church that they practice uh, soaking prayer. You familiar with soaking prayer? Uh, people lay on the carpet and they pray for each other. They just soak each other with prayer. And so most of the people had left the building, but there's probably still 500 people or so laying on the carpet praying for each other. And uh, in any case, I'm up, as I'm saying, I was up on the stage talking to someone, and two ladies beckoned me to come to the edge of the stage. And so I walk over to the edge of the stage. It's a really high one. It's about six feet up. And... I looked down at them and they said, would you pray for the woman in a wheelchair over there? And uh, we're telling MS stories tonight. I don't know why that is. It just, just occurred to me to tell this story. But in any case, uh, so I uh, said, certainly. So I came in off the stage. Now, I'm not afraid of wheelchairs, kind of like TD's not. One of the reasons we're not afraid of wheelchairs is that we know we're not doing it. See, when it, when it goes from here to here, when you know you're not doing it, you're not afraid anymore. See, I know at a deep level, an emotional level, that when I pray for someone's cancer, I'm not healing them. You ready to understand that? Therefore, I do not put myself under any kind of pressure. I pray for everything exactly the same. One healing is no different for me than another. I can't even heal a common cold in my own power. Therefore, why should I become anxious about cancer? You understand? Once you get it from here to here, you see, everybody knows intellectually that they don't have the capacity. But see, you're going to need to know in your heart that you don't have the capacity. Therefore, you quit trying. You rest in the completed work of Christ. You rest in the fact that it is God's will for them. You rest in the fact that the Holy Spirit has ample power, whether you feel it or not. See, I don't necessarily feel powerful. In fact, I, most of the time I don't. I feel 
in myself, I feel inadequate, but I know someone who is very adequate to do this. Everybody, and he, and he lives here. He lives there. He lives there. Okay. And he's always adequate to heal the sick, even if I feel inadequate myself. I'm not waiting for him to become powerful. He's already powerful, even if I don't feel it. Okay. Everybody understand that? It's the difference of focusing on your anointing as opposed to the anointed one. I don't focus on my anointing. I focus on the anointed one. And there is a relationship. <laughs> In any case, uh, so I get down to this lady. She has full-blown MS. She can turn her head one direction. She can't turn, turn her head the other direction. She has one arm functional. The other arm is in a sling, dead weight, pulling on her shoulders. Her two friends had to get her to come to that evening because uh, she uh, was feeling so much pain uh, all through her body that she didn't want to come. She didn't want to leave her, leave her hotel room. She just wanted to stay in the hotel room. But her friends forced her to come, and so she didn't receive healing when they prayed for her the first time, uh, which doesn't tell us what God's will is. By the way, you can be prayed for a hundred times. It still doesn't tell you what God's will is. You've got to determine the will of God from Christ, not from your experience of either healing, getting healed or not getting healed. In any case, so I laid hands on her. Her name's Elaine. She uh, is from Denver, Colorado. I put my hands on her. Nothing is happening. Now, you can interpret nothing as happening in several ways. You can say, God doesn't want to do that. Now, but that's a wrong interpretation because, again, we're not determining the will of God through experience. We're determining the will of God by he who shows us what the will of God looks like, and that's Christ. You want to know what the will of God looks like? It looks like Jesus. That's what it looks like. He shows us the will of the Father by perfectly doing the Father's will. So, knowing that... I know that, uh, that I'm the same guy that was getting people healed up on stage. And I probably haven't changed in the last 30 minutes. Uh, so I, the problem is going to be with Elaine. Now, now in, te- in doing this, if you're not familiar with what I'm doing here, you might think I'm blaming her. I am not interested in blaming anybody. That's not productive. It doesn't lead anybody to healing by blaming them. However, if you don't know where the problem is, you can't solve it. You hear that? Can I promise you this? God is not the problem. If there's going to be a problem, you are. Turn to somebody and say, I knew that all along. You're the problem. <laughs> See, if there's going to be a problem, the problem is going to be with you. Now, this is good news. Believe it or not, this is good news because if the problem's with you, you can fix it. But if the problem was with God, I promise you, you're not going to fix it. But I promise you this, the problem is not with God. It wasn't with Jesus, and he shows us what the Father looks like. He healed everyone who came. And if the problem's with us, then we can fix that. We can adjust to the truth. The truth will set us free. It'll make us whole. We can reinterpret our past. All the experiences of not seeing someone healed can be reinterpreted. They can, we can see it from the perspective of what the New Testament actually reveals. And you'll need to do that. You'll need to reinterpret some things that have happened in your past in order, to, in order for it to work in your future. In any case, so I say to Elaine, Elaine, uh, by any chance, are you connecting your sickness, your MS, with some event out of your past that makes you feel guilty? Elaine says, immediately says yes. Now, I didn't get a word of knowledge. I just know the devil does that. He wants to give purpose, a divine purpose to people's sickness. God's judging you, divine purpose. God's teaching you, divine purpose. Given divine purpose to sickness. Why does that, why does he want to do that? First of all, he wants you to blame God in a, religious kind of way. It won't sound like blame. You know, he wants you to declare that God is doing something to you that God is not actually doing. So he gives divine purpose to it. So I said to Elaine, are you connecting it? She said, yes. I said, Elaine, is it something you feel guilty over? Yes. In other words, Elaine believes she's being judged by God with MS. So I said, Elaine, I bet you've confessed that thing to the Lord 10,000 times, haven't you? Yes, I said, but you still don't feel, feel forgiven, do you? Nope. I said, okay, Elaine, I want you to 
Close your eyes for a moment. I'm going to give you a parable of your forgiveness. You know, Jesus taught in parables, visualized things. Uh, Jesus taught, uh, used visualization, uh, visualization a long time before the New Agers picked it up. It's okay for us to use it too. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. It's a good way to communicate truth to people is create a parable for them to visualize it. In any case, I said, Elaine, here you are. I see you're standing before the throne of God and you're wearing white linen. It's the white linen of the saints. It's the righteousness of Christ. And you're dressed from head to toe. All your sins are covered. God doesn't see your sins because of what Jesus has done. And this thing, this garment that you've been given has come as a gift from God. You didn't earn it, it but you are completely declared righteous by, the, by virtue of what Jesus has done. This is what justification means, by the way. Justified, made righteous before God. The gift of righteousness comes to us. It's a gift. We don't earn it. And, uh, and when, when God sees our righteousness, we are completely righteous before him. We are as righteous as Jesus Christ is. So, so Elena says, yes, you can see that. I, I can see that. I said, okay, Elaine, you're surrounded by thousands and thousands of other people. And they're all received by the Father just in the same way you've been received because of the righteousness of Christ. I said, you've all received this gift. You, nobody is more righteous than another. You're all received by the Father. Can you see that? Yes, I can see that. Okay, let's do the, do the confession again. This healing belongs to me because of what Jesus has done. Elaine uh, immediately looks up and she said, I just felt all my pain leave. I said, well, wonderful, Elaine. Would you like to keep praying? She said, oh, yes. I said, okay. I said, would you like us to lay hands on that arm that doesn't work? And she says, sure. So I, I do that. And, and pretty soon she's feeling a little heat on her arm. Heat is an ordinary manifestation of healing. Uh, it's, it's worldwide phenomenon. Just about everybody who ministers healing will confess to having heat happen. If it's a little bit of heat, it's typically a healing. If it's a lot of heat where the person actually starts to radiate heat, we think that's a, what the Bible calls a cleansing. Clean, Jesus cleansed the lepers. It's a kind of healing, but it's a system-wide healing. People uh, sometimes will get so hot that they're really hot, you know, really hot to the touch. Sometimes when have people have had cancer that spread, they'll get a cleansing. We'll see that as well. Um, any case, uh, so Elaine uh, feels heat in the arm. So I said, would you like your two friends to take it out of the sling? And she says, yes. So I said, okay. They, by the time she gets it out of the sling, she's doing this with that arm she couldn't move before. Well, her two friends just go completely bonkers. I mean, they begin to shout and jump around and, and, you know, thank the Lord and so on. Well, there's 500 other people that are in this sanctuary. They're laying on the carpet praying for each other. All of a sudden, we've got 500 people watching. And here's the problem. In North America, in England too, to some degree, um, faith is fragile in the area of healing. If you don't get it working pretty fast, people will give up on you. And uh, <clears throat> so what we're seeing here is something happening pieces. She's getting a partial healing. She's getting a level of partial healing and so on. So I have to get the folks on board because here's the, here's the truth. 500 unbelieving people praying does not help. <laughs> How many people does it take you to get somebody healed? How many people does it take to get someone healed? He said it. I've gotten healed by myself. Nobody praying for me. Okay? But generally speaking, it's easier to get healing working with a few than it is a large group. Now, that's misconception. See, I get people send me emails all the time. We had 10,000 people on an email list praying for that person. What makes them think that 10,000 people can agree on anything? <laughs> and it's an expression of unbelief rather than expression of faith because the idea is that if we just get a hundred, you know, get lots of people voting yes, that God's going to go along with it. <laughs> Healing was God's idea to start with. This uh, is coming at the thing completely backwards. That somehow we have to convince him to do this. And when we take that attitude, I promise you, healing will not occur. It doesn't happen when we do it that way. Thinking that somehow or another we have to just put pressure on God to do that. That whole idea is full of unbelief. You see that? So in any case, there's 500 people and they're going to give up on me pretty quickly if she's not out of that wheelchair. So I... Uh, 
do something that I highly recommend, is that if you're going to receive a healing this weekend, I hope you do, if you're going to receive a healing, don't be in an all or nothing mode. Receive what you can the first time we pray and acknowledge it. If you are better, then say so. Because what happens is typically if people wait till it's all happening, they don't get it before they'll acknowledge that God's doing anything. See, if, you, if we pray for you and you are better, you know you are, be honest, you don't have to be dishonest, I'm not saying that. You be honest, but if you're better, you ought to acknowledge, yes, that is better. Because what happens almost immediately when someone acknowledges that God has done something in the circumstance, they get more. And what we see many times is what we call critical mass. And I'm going to tell you, Elaine got to critical mass before too long. Uh, she was standing up in the wheelchair before too long because healing was continuing. She was confessing to feel stuff going up and down in her leg. At the same time, I'm telling, before they, even she stood up, I was telling these folks, you need to rejoice with me that Elaine's able to move her arm. She couldn't do that before. You need to rejoice with me that Elaine was, uh, uh, Elaine was in pain and she, all her pain has disappeared. That Elaine is in process here. She's receiving her healing. So hang in here with me. I'm getting them on board so that they'll be able to understand what's happening because if they don't see her out of the wheelchair, because that's how they're measuring it. They're measuring it well, whether or not she's out of the wheelchair. See, what we see often with people in wheelchairs is they get healed while they're in the wheelchair. And then they get out. They're already healed when they get out. See, see, people are waiting for the dramatic moment where somebody jerks someone out or something. Uh, healing is pretty, it can be pretty, you know, somebody's out of a wheelchair is pretty dramatic. However, their healing actually occurred in an undramatic way while they were sitting in the wheelchair. You see the difference? If you're only looking for the dramatic moment, you won't see much healing. Because a lot of healing is kind of quiet. It just happens as we're praying for people. It doesn't produce a dramatic moment. It just changes the condition. But then when they come back to testify, you get that drama. But if you're only looking for drama, uh, you won't get much healing happening. A friend of mine, an evangelist that I trained in healing ministry, he, the first time I talked to him, he was on the phone very discouraged about healing. And he says, Roger, the first 20 people I prayed for all died. <laughs> I said, well, two things, brother. And he said, he says, what's that? And I said, um, number one, two things. Number one, please don't pray for me. <laughs> number two, I know something about the people that you're praying for. And he said, what's that? He says, they're all dying. Why don't you pray for a bad back? Why don't you pray for a headache? Why don't you pray? You're only going for the drama. And you're not there for it. You're not, your, your faith is not there for it. Why don't you pray for some things where people are not dying? And get it working. And then go for the dramatic moment. You see the difference? Sometimes that's what people are doing. They, they ignore all the people that are in pain and so on around them to go for the person who's dying. Well, get it working with all the other folks too. The, the person who's dying is not the only, only person who needs prayer. Come on, get your, shake, shake your head. I'm telling you some wisdom here. I'm giving you some wisdom whether you see it or not. <laughs> in any case, um, Elaine in the next few minutes uh, started walking almost like T.D.'s description, pushing a, one foot in front of her uh, really slowly. Uh, and then actually was dragging it more than she was pushing. I guess at first it was a push and then a kind of a drag. Uh, that went on for some time, and uh, when I felt like she had her balance, I just let go of her, and she started walking pretty normally, and then started running, and uh, completely free from MS. Um, she, in fact, they chased her with the wheelchair around the church. You know? <laughs> she was running all around the church. The next day, she walked over to the hotel I was staying in and, and left me a card. She was not able to write before, and just thanked me for the time. They tell me from beginning to end of the time that I actually went down off the stage to talk to her and the time that she was running was 40 minutes. So I just, I wanted to share that with you that these things are, uh, can occur in stages, you know, so you get a different concept of how it might happen. Because any one of you can do what I did. You just have to stick with it and you just have to have the right concepts to work with. The fact is that she didn't receive anything the first time I talked to her 
And first time I prayed for her, did not tell me what God's will is. I get the will of God from seeing what the Son of God did in the, uh, the, did in the Gospels. The will of God is expressed through Jesus Christ. Here's a simple truth that really can be life transforming if you really begin to apply it. The Father is like the Son and the Son is like the Father. The Son perfectly did the Father's will while he was on earth. And therefore that is a perfect expression of what God wants for you and I. That's why those four books, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, are called the Gospels, which means good news. Because when we see Jesus there ministering to people, it should be good news to us. Because there had to be people just like you in the multitudes, with all your concerns and all the situations that you're facing. And Jesus healed them all. We do something we call, and I'll talk about this again tomorrow, it's a pretty simple technique. 90% of the problem of receiving a healing in the Western world, really wherever the uh, wherever the British Empire was, has been the fact that uh, people are unclear about what God's will was. They're looking for the will of God in different kinds of ways than than the disciples would have understood it. They're looking for a word of knowledge to come, a dream, a vision to tell them what God's will is. Whereas the early church didn't, didn't approach it that way. Words of knowledge are real and they do happen and God does reveal his will in some cases. But we really don't need that. We can really look to Jesus who shows us what the will of the Father is. A technique that I use is called the time machine. And it goes like this. I use this in a hospital quite often, but I often bring it up because we want to equip people with simple ways to bring the truth. And so... The time machine goes like this. If we could get you into a time machine and take you back 2,000 years to one of those healing events where Jesus was healing everyone, wouldn't he heal you? The answer is fairly simple. Yes, of course, he would heal me. Well, the scripture declares, well, first of all, we need to say we don't have a time machine, but we don't need one because the scripture declares that, that this very same Jesus that is in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John is seated at the right hand of God the Father. And it says this, it says, He is the same yesterday. That's Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Today, seated at the right hand of God the Father and yes, forever. So yeah, Jesus that won't heal you is very unlike the Jesus of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Good news, yes?